The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and this week we're diving into another one of our Advice Tech sequel episodes where we bring back a previous guest on the show to get an update on new features, enhancements and all the wonderful things they've been up to since we last heard from them. Now here today to keep us up to date on all things Padua is the founder and co-CEO of Padua. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Anne-Marie Esler. Woo! Welcome, welcome. Wow. Thank you for that introduction, <laughs> Peter, and I am very glad to be here. Woo, and we're back in 2024. Woo, far out. That mm, happened fast, didn't already. it? Already. Mm-hmm. I know, it, and I feel like it's nearly the end of January already as I well. <laughs> it's crazy. Wasn't like last month's 2020. Seriously, it's just <laughs> nuts. <laughs> it's all going too fast. Speaking of which, you actually previously joined us on episode 23 of the show. We are now in episode 67, would you believe? And that feels like such a long time ago. <laughs> so you must have had so many interviews with so many different people since then. I did. a lot, Lots and lots of me talking. I feel like I should apologise to the audience. You guys have listened to many hours of me gibbering many away. Many hours of Peter. <laughs> and they're still coming back for more. Exactly. You <laughs> poor, poor things. Now, as you know, normally we take a moment at the start to get to know you through your use of technology. Now, we couldn't possibly ask you the same questions as last time. So to get you to, to know you even a little bit better, we're going to ask you a couple of things. First up, if someone came to you and said, we're going to build you your very own AI buddy just for you, what task would you want it to magically do for you? My AI buddy would appear for me in all of my meetings in replace of me <laughs> and take notes for me and report back a summary of those meetings so that I could do other things in the background. Nice. So it's 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 a, like you 2.0 that's actually – so it can interact as you as well as take notes and then summer. I like it. I it would just like be it. me in a, in a different format. So everyone nice. would think that it was me there. But it wouldn't actually be actually me. be you, your digital version. Oh, I think that is a fabulous idea. And anybody listening in AI, I, <laughs> I second that motion. I could absolutely do with one of those. <laughs> now, flipping to the other side of tech, you know, not all new tech is good tech. We all know that. Is there a more analog version of technology that you actually prefer or you've sort of held on to? Yes, of course there is. I'm actually very old school. <laughs> and the one thing that I cannot live without is my to-do list in a paper format on my desk with my pen, notepad, tick it off at the end of every day. That's yeah. what I cannot live without. Yeah. That's a common refrain, I've got to say. I, I mean, I've still got what well, well, when I was in investment banking, my boss, when I first started straight out of, straight out of uni, um, said you need to have a day book. And a day book was, you know, every day you start, you write the date down and just any notes you take, you keep in the day book. And I've kept them all since I started working. <laughs> and I just can't bring myself to change it. It's just this ritual that gives me comfort. It means if I've got to remember something way back when, you can sort of look at the day and get some context. It's I get it. I'm right there with you. 
I'm actually in the midst of two notebooks at the moment, so I have to take to every meeting two notebooks so that if anything, <laughs> I need to reference anything from last year, right. I have it in my old notebook and then I've got my new my notebook 2024. So there's a transition period where I'm using both notebooks, which is <laughs> probably not a great look, but that is what I cannot do without. If it, if it gets it done, I think it's all good. You know, very so, satisfying to tick those boxes it? at the end of the day. Even sometimes sneaking one in, you've already done to tick it off. <laughs> I might have done that before. <laughs> so let's dive into Pedro and what you guys have been up to, which has actually been loads uh, since we last spoke. But let's start first for those who haven't listened to our previous interview. Um, where does Pedro sit in that advice tech space? What category does it generally fall under? So we assist financial advisors in providing high quality advice to their clients. So our space is in the generation of financial advice for financial advisors. So our services team provides services for financial advisors. They use our technology to produce those services, mostly statement of advice and other types of advice documents. And then we also provide our technology to financial advisors for them to use as well within their practice. Perfect. And so then you guys, you have some people probably start with the tech and maybe then over time need some more bandwidth, maybe work you know, with your team as well, who sometimes are the bodies and vice versa, I'd imagine. So it can be quite fluid between whether people just use the technology or also use services. Is that fair? Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah. And we have different advisor groups using different components of our services. So we might have advice starting with our transition services where we assist with high volume rollovers and new investment strategies or we might do some foundation SOAs in that part, then they might decide that they would like some assistance with their power planning, so we'll help them out there. Um, And then obviously they can do some DIY stuff on the side too if they're using our technology. So there's a bit of a combination of different uses that advisors would um, seek our services and software for. Awesome. And now, listener, if you haven't heard of Padua before, then please do go back to episode 23. Um, Both Matt and Anne-Marie went through in a whole lot of detail, and I think it'll give you a good foundation in what they do, um, as we're going to sort of be covering new ground from here on in. So if it is brand new to you, feel free to listen. But uh, just in case you have no earthly clue what we're talking about, then episode 23 is the one to look back to. Now, let's talk about some big old projects you guys have been working on in the last sort of vague. 12 months. There's been a particularly large one that you've, and you sort of started mentioning it then, which is this sort of bulk or book analysis project you guys have have worked on and and implemented a number of times, I believe. Yes, that's right. So there's a couple of different components to it and it is very exciting. It's something that we started doing last year. So we've been offering transition services since the beginning of time. So Padua is now 10 years old. We are very Mm -hmm. happy to announce. So we've just had our 10-year anniversary and transition management has been with us since the very, very beginning. It was kind of the flagship of what we started our business around. But last year, we expanded that to include, as you said, a book analysis. So clients that were advisor groups that were giving us um, their transition management projects to work on, we would have to collect a whole lot of data. Um, and that would be the CRM data, the platform data, CGT information, which could come from a combination of those things, um, advice fee data, a whole range of different data points from different software or, you know, Excel spreadsheets, CSV files, PDFs, a whole range of different things. And we would collect all of that information and collate it in order to, pro- you know, provide a transition service, which was a project management of from beginning to end of a an advisor wanting to either change platforms, change investment strategies, and do a big bulk rollover um, of, you know, a whole client book. Yeah. And that could, just to clarify that, just so everybody's um, listening is clear, that there's sort of two broad reasons for that, isn't there? There's either an external book, meaning that maybe the practice has purchased another business or whatever, and they've, you know, quite different approach or quite different platform or investment approach. And so therefore it's about literally merging it into the current business's approach. So that's one transition, or it could be within the current business when they've made a decision to go from one platform to another or one methodology to another. Is that the sort of two key triggers for this type of project? Yeah, definitely. And in terms of that first one too, it's acquiring other businesses, but it's also, you know, um, because businesses have been built up over time, there's a lot of legacy products that have come (laughs) with that. And so some advisor practices find themselves with, 
you know, five or eight or 10 different platforms that they're trying to service their client base across. And it becomes very cumbersome and inefficient. And so they might be looking to consolidate into a platform. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's kind of that first part, as you said. And then the second one is, okay, we're already on this platform, but we actually want to move now to this platform because it has a better offering or a better pricing structure or better features that are more suited to our clients. Yeah, perfect. And so talk us through the book analysis because this is um, (laughs) – I love the – when you guys first sort of ran through this and I went to one of the presentations where you ran through it and you could hear the crickets in the room as advisors realised the time it would save them instead of having to approach this one at a time. So so in terms of what it's doing, what is it analysing and therefore – spitting out in terms of potential either time savers or action items out of, say, an analysis of a book? So what it's doing is it's pulling those data points from all of those different sources into one spot. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that we do is then look at all the gaps in the data. And so out of hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands and thousands of a client list, we can see that there are 267 clients that don't have a date of birth lodged in the CRA, or there's 533 clients that the platform data doesn't match with the CRM and it's not connected or not linked, so you don't get any of the data feeds through. Yeah. Or there are 795, and I'm just throwing these numbers yeah. out, <laughs> um, clients that don't have a risk profile, for example, right. or a certain number of clients that aren't being charged an upfront fee or the upfront fee is too low or the upfront or the ongoing fee is too high. Or, so we can have all of this data for thousands and thousands of clients with thousands and thousands of data points collected and we can see all of the gaps in the data and we can provide that back to the practice so that they can then clean up the data and, and fill in those gaps right. and ensure that their data is clean data then that is available to be used and you know more efficiently um, collected and collated and and then used within mm. the practice. Mm. And and the, it's so interesting, the data gaps, having done a few portfolios historically that we've taken on, um, all of us are confident that the data we have for our clients is fabulous. The yeah. challenge is that that is probably true for the people that you, that you interact with the most, but there'll be some clients that aren't quite as interacted with or came through a time period when you were collecting different data or you were collecting it a different way or with a different system. Oh, there's so many reasons there is inconsistency. And when you are trying to either look at a new book or it's coming across and you're trying to systematically take action um, mm. and onboard these people, like the quality of that data can make a massive difference to how hard that onboarding process is, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely the first point um, as, as a tidy up. It has been a real eye opener to realize the gaps that are in the data and to see that advisor practices are using all different sources of data and trying to work out a way to have it all in the one spot and to have it all available and, and completed. But that's proving so difficult because you know, we're working with numerous, numerous platforms to pull data um, and collate it as part of our, that client analysis, book analysis. And the way that you collect data from each of the platforms is different and <laughs> the output is so different and the data points are so different. And And what we're trying to do is trying to have a systematic approach and our software is able to do this for us is to have a systematic approach where we've got standardized data points so that depending on doesn't matter which platform we're going to pull the data from, they'll pull the data into the correct column within a particular spreadsheet right. to fill in that data, the missing data pieces. So we can pull something from one platform and then we can pull another part in from a CRM and it will all be collated into that one um, central central spot. Yeah, so you guys, what's good about that is you guys have sort of done the hard yards in in translating all of these That's different right. data sources, which is horribilous, I've got to say. Like that process, even the the names they use for things can mean different things and you think that, I mean, even consent and dates around consent, like they all use different expressions for different things and like it's just, yeah, it's a disaster. Okay, so the first step then is this cleanse this sort of cleanse. You know, gap analysis for the data and then you know the practice cleanses what then happens after that okay 
So that enables then the practice to be able to clean up the data and yeah. for us to be able to provide those gaps to them. Yep. Um, and then for us to be able to also push that data back into the various positions if required. Yep. Um, so that the data is more complete. Yeah. So then the second phase is then is the analysis on the existing platforms and the existing fees that are being paid and then to do that comparison at that full client book level against a potential recommended platform and yep. a number of different alternatives. Um, and that can be at the platform level or the underlying investment option if, if you know, the strategy, investment strategy level, if you're looking to retain the platform but just change the investment strategy. Yep. Um, so that's then the next step is to do that full analysis of all of the features and all of the fees that are on all of the multiple existing platforms yep. and then the recommended against alternatives. Wow. Okay. So as opposed to what I'm sure somebody listening is like, oh, I wish I had this. <laughs> Previously, they've probably gone through some process where probably for lots of them, they've done it one client at a time. You know, there's just a schedule of reviews and they go in, oh, okay, let's take a look at you and your analysis side by side. You know, you do all this. So what's fantastic is you guys will have then, I'm assuming, identified those where the client, it's in their best interest. It's clear, like it's a clear, Mm -hmm. you know, the client is clearly better off or ones where possibly they just can't be moved. Maybe they're grandfathered for age pension and therefore, you know, like it would actually be a negative potentially for the client if they did change platform say. So yep. I'm, is that what I'm like, I'm picturing something that sort of identifies the ones where it's like, yeah. yes, definitely take a closer look or mm, warning Will Robinson, there may yeah. not be value in doing this. Is that the sort of thing that they then have on sort of a massive list? So what we do is we have a number of flags. So we have a green flag for go. Mm-hmm. We have an orange or an amber flag, which is you can kind of go, but you might need to do some further investigation. Right. So, for example, it might be, yeah, a grandfathered product. It might be insurance within superannuation. You might need to have right. a look at that. Yep. It might be CGT implications for moving. Um, there might be other, you know, other factors that it might be okay, but you just need to look at that further and do some further investigation. And then we've got some red flags where it's, no, you can't move this client. Yeah. Um, it's a no-go and that'll be the red flag. And then we also kind of do, we provide, you know, visuals graphs and charts and things to show the advisor so green orange and red flags but then also you know we can um the fee savings or the feature yep. benefits increasing and we can we can break that up into different components so you know platform fees are increasing but investment fees are decreasing or um yep. you know that sort of thing and we can order it and categorize it depending on the client balances um we incorporate fee aggregation now to build that into a software system, oh my goodness, <laughs> family fee aggregation to cater for every fee <laughs> type and calc oh. and spousal family right. groupings. It's crazy. Incredible. Yeah, it's crazy. The, the, for something that should actually be relatively easy, like as a concept, it seems easy, it just so is not. <laughs> it's just so difficult and so different. By platform, it's ridiculous. It is. It is. And having and then capturing it all and then calculating it for groups of clients. Yeah. So we're not just showing the in the fees for the individuals, we're showing the family grouping and their yeah. fees. And in some platforms, you know, when you do the comparison, the individuals might be better off by moving, but as a family group, because of the family fee aggregation and the savings they make there they might be better off. So yeah, yeah. you have to do the calculations to see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, okay, so then they've got this sort of, which I like the sort of traffic light mm-hmm. um, summary, which must be super helpful. And, I, and I'm curious actually on that basis. So I could imagine, well, I'm imagining that you've done previous projects where somebody's already in this, right? So they, <laughs> they may have started this and, the, and they're in transitioning and then go, Oh my wordy lordy, this is really hard. We need assistance. You guys have come in. You've done all this analysis, right? So I can see that happening. Is are you at the point though where anybody's doing this before they actually take on a full book? Like they're sort of going, well, we want to know what this looks like before we take it on because that's part of the value assessment, you know, in terms of maybe a purchase price or a similar. Are they sort of doing it before they embark as a way to really assess if it's worthwhile? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. 
So we've assisted several advisor practices who are looking at purchasing a book of clients okay. and we'll come in and do the analysis before the purchase occurs yeah. to determine whether or not that's a viable option. Yeah. And similarly, you know, we've had advisor groups come to us and think that they're going to move to this particular platform and we do the analysis and then they realize, well, actually, we're better off where we are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's not until you see that broader picture, is it? Because you can do one or two. Like you could assess a a handful of clients that you feel might represent the average or something like that. But it's not until you look across the the um the book that you see the themes or you see the reasons why. Well, hold on, actually, we have more. So, for example, families who are fee aggregating. Actually, once we do that, those numbers aren't actually better off. You know that sort of stuff. It's it's all of that information together, and and to do it on mass, like I mean, that is such for an advisor or a practice to do that themselves manually would be like they Boom. might quit. <laughs> Like, you know what? I'm getting out of advice now. This is too hard if they yeah. try to do it themselves. Um, I know. I know. It's a huge, huge, huge task. And we've got a whole project team that is working on our book analysis and yeah. another separate team that then does all the transition management. Okay. Because the third step then is we actually assist the advisor practice to go through that whole transition management process and move the client. Right to that new platform or investment strategy. So we assist yeah. with all the advice documents um, and everything else that they need to transfer. So the application forms and the inspector transfer forms and all of that um, extra documentation. But yeah, like we have a whole team that are doing that. We have a whole team that are doing book analysis. So for an advisor practice, you know, it can be a huge help to yeah. have all those resources available for them to use. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. We, um, I mean, we've been talking about predominantly platform to platform, but it, you know, there's a lot of um, work and discussion on the ensemble platform about investment methodologies and coming up with that and, and having an approach and therefore, you know, how are you going to implement that for your clients? What a powerful thing to do to then say, all right, we've got this new methodology. Let's do the analysis first before we implement it to see what that's going to mean for clients um, and to use, you know, assistants like you guys to then take a look at that. And what now that doesn't mean that it's not worth, say, the cost to the client, but being able to see that across your book, you know, that's really powerful before you dive in deep um, to implementing stuff, you know, and then go, wait a minute, I need to wind back, you know. (laughs) Um, So bulk analysis like that that somebody can take care of is so, so powerful. So in terms of the proportion of, you know, how how much of your team, like broader team's time is now spent doing this? Has this become quite a significant part of what you guys assist people with? It was a huge focus for 2023. Yeah, we pivoted a number of our team members onto our book analysis project. Um, and obviously it was a big tech resource too and a big tech build. So we had to put sufficient resources um, there to build the system that was able to do this for us in the first place. Yeah. I mean, power planning was kind of our number one revenue source and, mm-hmm. it, and it still is, but that's now been, you know, a little bit reduced because yep. of the increase in the book analysis and the transitions. Yeah. And what we're hoping too is that, you know, we do the book analysis Clients move on to transitions, we assist with that, and then because that's a fantastic, wonderful service, they think, well, let's um, get Padua to assist with our power planning as well. And so, yeah, perfect. Um, perfect. Yeah. And what a, um, I mean, none of these processes are quite as, as simple as we've just described. <laughs> step one, step two, step three, you're done. The whole thing's transition. It's not quite like that. There's a lot of work, but, yeah. but it, you know, when done thoroughly and well, it's, there's a huge amount of accomplishment in managing to do that and actually have something at the other end that, that the team and your clients have survived and actually are better off. Yeah. Um, whereas often when, when, you know, businesses embark on these things on their own, it's, it's just, demoralizing to be honest because it's such a hard slog uh so to have somebody help you through that and have done sort of the hard work on that analysis um mm. and the tools to do that that's really exciting really really and we, exciting. we also feel that um if advisors are doing it as a project and it's separate from their normal bau and it's done within a set time frame yep a lot of advisors say oh yeah i'll be able to do that i'll just do it over review right. over the next 12 months and you kind of think well actually you probably won't get it done then. If yeah. you're going to do it over a 12-month period, you're waiting to see the clients, you're having the conversations. It's going to take a really long period of time. Yeah. Um, if you're doing it in three months or six months and just 
hit it out and yeah. get it done within that time frame, it's it's a lot more beneficial and it actually works and it gets done. And if the well, clients are better off in terms of fee savings, then the quicker you do it, the better. Fantastic. And and look, the team probably gets pretty efficient in terms of lodgements and like the whole processing because it's, you know, they're getting really good at it and practiced. And and I'm, I'm betting also that any of the platforms, if, if, you know, a practice gave them a heads up, this was happening and they've got, you know, the practice has you guys on their side and then they also get the platform on their side, then I reckon between everybody, the whole thing could be a whole lot smoother than it yeah. might otherwise be. Yeah, that's right. For sure. So, I mean, you know, that's not a small thing that you guys have been up to in the last <laughs> 12 months. No. What el- you know, what else has been going on uh, with Padua, with the system? You know, any other changes to the tool or, or tweaks that have been happening in the last sort of year? So, the other thing that we're working on, and I was going to talk about this in terms of the smaller tweaks, but um, really what we're doing is a big overhaul of our para planning recommend system. So that's okay. where advisors submit their advice requests requests to us and yep. we produce an advice document for the advisor. Yep. Um, so we've been talking for some time about the whole range of financial planning strategies that are available within the financial planning market, mm-hmm. but the fact that advisors actually only use a very small few of those financial strategies. But if they had the technology available to them yep. to filter down based on the client's circumstances, the thousands and thousands of strategies that are available to them, um, depending on, you know, the client's suitability and, you know, whether they're a homeowner, non-homeowner client, you know, single, couple, what their assets, liabilities, all of those things are. And if that could filter out the eligibility of the client for particular strategies right. and come up with a list of strategies that the client will be better off by undertaking. Yeah. And if they had that technology to enable them to do that, that would be a really powerful tool for financial advisors. So at the moment, our recommend system has a number of strategies and it guides the advisor to ask a series of questions, which will then feed answers through to populate the SOA and and direct benefits and you know potential losses yep. um, that are needed to populate the SOA yeah. into the SOA. Um, but we're hoping to expand that hugely over the next 12 months um, to accommodate the very, very num- huge number of strategies that an advisor can be using. So it's sort of, um, for want of a better expression, providing these guardrails. So saying, well, look, make sure you've considered all of these, like, like and little- not all 5,000, but just like we've already narrowed it down to what's possible yes. for that client. At least, can you know, make sure you consider these. What it, And I, what I like about that is it's such a, um, it's a bit of the checklist manifesto approach, you know, where you just make sure, even if, even if your response is, no, I don't think that's appropriate for the client. And it could be because they're never going to complete the paperwork or they're never going to, like what, whatever the reasoning is, how thorough it would be to then be able to note on file the things that you've considered and why and why you're not or you are doing them. You know, that's a, that rigor is so powerful um, yeah. going forward. And I could see it as being a really great tool as well for professional year. Um, you know, staff, because if it can, once again, so they can bump up, bump against those guardrails as they're starting the process of providing advice, that's fantastic. You know, we all learn by doing, don't we? So, you know, yeah, for that and it's, to- it's providing those advisors with, it's kind of expanding the options that are potentially available for their clients. Yeah. And having them, as you said, to consider each of those options and not just rely on the, you know, the five, five or 10 strategies that they are used to recommending for all clients it's kind of providing more options um, and allowing them and giving them those parameters as you said the guardrails to determine whether or not they are particularly suited to a client and the first thing is you know whether their circumstances allow them whether they're eligible to receive them depending on their age and their circumstances yeah Um, but then the next conversation and the next part of the conversation that the advisor will be having though is whether it's suitable to that particular client right and as right. you said, because the 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 strategy might provide a financial benefit, and it might they, the client might be eligible, but if they're never going to implement it, no, <laughs> and they're never going to right, fill in the paperwork, then you know what is the point of recommending it? That's yeah, because right. there's as we all know, there's more than just the 
the numbers, you know, in all of these, when we've got to balance these up for clients, you know, it's, it's the likelihood of it happening or the stress it might deliver for them or, you know, all these sort of things. But, and we but, all know, we all know we have got clients where there's particular shares that they will not sell because yes. they are, were owned <laughs> by my grandmother and yeah. I'm never going to sell them, even though the numbers might suggest that now is the time to sell exactly. those shares. Exactly. But I think, you know, I think, you know, even that client would appreciate a look. I know we've mentioned it before, just reinforcing there is value there if you wanted to take advantage, but I understand you wouldn't want to, you know, you might not want to do this. I'm just reminding you because I actually think that's our role. Yeah. You know, a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a reminder. I get that you said you don't want to, just letting you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's still the opportunity still there. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I mean, there's the gut. Yeah. I love that idea of, of narrowing it down and look, our brains aren't computers. So, you know, having, um, something like that, that frees us up to be more human with the clients and then relying on something else to be the computer makes Mm. a lot of sense. Um, that's right. Rather than just all in our head. Now, the other thing that I did notice, I think I saw a post recently, you guys have revamped your website. Was there anything particularly that triggered that? Or was that just a, you know, we feel like we need a zhuzh up, um, with all the things we've been doing in the last year? Uh, we just, yes, we've, we've launched our new website. Um, it's just been released and yeah, I think it is a better reflection of what we're doing now. Yep. Um, we needed to be clearer on what we were offering. Yep. And we needed to explain ourselves, our software part and our services part and how they work together um, a little bit clearer. And right. we also wanted to cater for the different offerings in terms of are you an advisor or a licensee, are you a product provider? Right. Um, because we're doing a lot more work with some of the platforms or investment managers. Okay. And so we wanted to be able to have a website that catered to that group of yeah. the industry as well. And I'm 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 only guessing, but I'm imagining some of that work is because they have old product that they've now got a new product they're hoping people will move into. So you guys can help them do some of that analysis um, on behalf of, say, even advice practices. But it's you know that platform, you know, being able to see that and see where the value is for clients and that sort of thing. Is that the type of project you might do for the platforms? Yes, yes. Yeah. So we've been engaged by a number of platforms just to do a high level analysis, as you say, yeah. of their platform against their biggest competitors and to show them where they, you know, are falling down or where they're shining. Um, what are some of the features that they have that other platforms aren't providing? Where are the fees that they are, you know, out? What's the sweet spot? Yeah or not? Yeah. yeah. What's the sweet spot in terms <laughs> of a number of different client balances, um, where they're winning and where they're losing? Yeah. Um, so we've done that for a number of different um, platforms and that's been extremely beneficial for them because not all of that information is readily available in the market. Like, No, no, it simply isn't. We have to do a lot isn't. of research. Our <laughs> research team works around the clock yeah. to make sure that we're up to date with all of the intricacies of each of the platforms. Yeah. And so that kind of information that we have been collecting for 10 years since we've been in business, yeah, is really, really helpful. Yeah, fantastic. And so is there anything that you've, um, you know, in terms of the practices that you've got on Padua that, that work well with you guys, is there anything that sort of has blown you away recently in terms of, you know, the way they've used your tech or services that's sort of like, oh, we hadn't thought of that, but it was a fantastic outcome for the practice? We ha- we've just had an advisor group that has been working really, they've spent a lot of time and effort in making sure that the API connection between their CRM and the Padua online fact find is working really well. And it's saving them a lot of time because they're able to send our fact find out to their clients to collect further information or to update information. Um, And then it comes back into our system. They can use that then to produce online DIY documents themselves so they can push it through into our power planning team. But the good thing then too is that that information that's been updated by their clients or by their team Mm. within our system can be pushed back to their CRM as well. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And it is something that's probably not it's not necessarily been done well, well as evidenced by the book analysis you guys do. Like the it may be over here in the advice production system or even in maybe an analysis tool, but it's not over there in the CRM. And actually the more information we have per client in the CRM, the more um, you know, uh 
campaigns you can do, the more insightful the conversations can be, or those, even the emails you send out. Like there's so much we can do when the CRM gets really rich that's outside of just the advice itself. Uh, yeah. That's, that is exciting to get that right. They must, and they probably, I mean, du- double entry, you know, oh, that's a horrible, <laughs> horrible thing to manage to knock out. Fantastic. No, that's right. Fantastic. Yeah, that's right. So because a lot of the CRMs have lots of custom fields. And so to be able to connect to those custom fields is really important yeah. because otherwise you're losing the data. Yeah. And so they've spent a, a bit of time working with us to ensure all of those custom fields are captured and we're able to pull all the data through and push it back successfully. So there's that seamless integration between the two systems, which um, yeah, is really helpful to their business. So yeah. that's good. And to the sanity of their team. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So looking forward, I mean, you guys clearly have been pretty busy. You probably need a bit of a lie down. I know that you and Matt have both had some holiday break because um, you've been up to a lot. You know, looking forward, what challenges are you seeing your users facing? And so what sort of things have you got on either the, either future development plans or things you're flagging that you know you're going to have to spend some time on into the future because of what's coming up for financial advisors? So I've got two things here. So the first one is that we were finding that some advisors were taking it too long within our recommend system to answer all the questions that we were asking. Yep. And so just before Christmas, we've cut that down. So we actually reduced each of our strategy questions by three. Okay. And so it meant that advisors are now taking less time to complete our advice request form to submit requests to Padua. Right. So we're hoping that that has been a positive improvement for our advisors. Yep. Um, and that they'll be able to submit lots more requests to us and it'll be take less time. Yeah. Perfect. So that was the first thing. And that was a small thing that we sort of released before Christmas, as I said. But the thing that we're looking forward this year, apart from our, you know, millions of strategies that we're going to be guard railing, yep. is obviously, you know, the outcomes of QAR <laughs> and what that's going to mean for everybody, what that means for statement of advice documents yeah. um, that are going to be providing advice still yeah (laughs) um that are going to look like a statement of advice but may may not be called a statement of advice and just how they're going to be delivered to clients and how we can accommodate and change um to deliver what you know the legislation requires um and i think we're in a really good position to be able to accommodate whatever it is that it ends up being yeah um and we're happy to pivot and change and modify our technology as we always have over the many years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And are you, I mean, I've sort of, well, I mean, you know, we're all a bit frustrated and, and given the, it seems like hundreds of years of just continual change we've had as this industry, it just feels a bit relentless. Um, we're all probably a little punch drunk. I know I feel a bit that way um, recently. And I've got to say that in, as I sort of looked at at all the possible outcomes and what they could all do, it sort of became clear to me that I'm not sure that the research and the the thinking and the the structure and the strategy and all the things we might otherwise do necessarily changes. It's just whether it's something we have internally that's really thorough and then uh, something gets presented to the client or whether actually it goes in the document that gets presented to the client. I sort of got my head to the point where I'm like, yeah. I think actually the work or the the guts will be pretty similar. It's just about what the client gets or receives may be significantly different. And so once I sort of got my head around that, I have to admit I calmed down a bit. Yeah. Just went, all right, well, whatever comes, comes. Um, yeah. But we're probably still going to have to have a whole lot of rigor anyway, yes. um, of course, but it just might be something that's internal on file um, that should it be needed to be referred to in the future, it, it does. Have you got a sort of similar take than that? I, I definitely do. You know, the research – that you would need to have on file that would back up the reasons why you made those recommendations, whether it be strategy recommendations or product recommendations, is still going to be exactly the same. You're still going to have to show these are the benefits, these are the downfalls, this is the why I did it, this is how it meets your objectives. All of those things that we currently do will still need to be collated and collected and put somewhere. Um, But as as you said, what actually is provided to the client and what output they actually receive could be different, mm. but who knows? Yeah, exactly. And and look, we'll wait with unbated breath. <laughs> yes. I'm not. I'm no longer yes. bated breath. I just. <laughs> I used to be bated breath. Yeah. No, no, not anymore. Run out of those. No more bated breath. Not even, it's not even sleepless nights anymore. Exactly. <laughs> We're back to sleeping. Exactly. It's totally fine. It's exactly right. And you know, we all sort of trundle along, and I think. 
look, what's so interesting about QAR? And I did have a thought actually over the break, you know, you're sort of chilling out and maybe you're having a lovely, um, you know, limoncello spritz or whatever everybody has at the end of a <laughs> lovely day at the beach and sort of contemplating and chatting to friends. And and I did wonder whether, you know, the combination of what they, they've been trying to do with QAR and then, of course, the last 12 to 18 months have been this storm of AI. I just wonder whether they're a bit betwixt and between because it's just so much for them, it's so many possibilities and change and what ifs. I just wonder whether had AI not done what it did or in terms of the public sphere and what we can all see it can do, I actually wonder whether we might be further along. You know, I just yeah, wonder um, whether just like, oh, wait a minute. Because <laughs> actually we need to accommodate for this exactly. thing that could be happening <laughs> like, in the future. Yeah, I wonder whether their heads just sort of exploded a bit and just went, oh, yeah. no, no we have to get a, we're going to have to give this some more thought. So, you know, and I, I get that. I sort of get that because it really has opened up the world, um, you know, a fair bit. In fact. Um, let's just jump into that. Is there outside your own tech, what tool or tools has caught have sort of caught your eye out there for advice tech or broader technology for business? You know, what sort of do you like out there that you've seen? Well, you know, you've just brought up the AI, mm. and you know, I mentioned earlier that you know I'd have a, a representative Anne Marie sitting in meetings, yeah. you know, and I'd just seen a couple of those avatars where you know you could have a situation where you're presenting a statement of advice to a client, but via a video, but it could actually be your avatar presenting yep. that SOA to the client. And, you know, as much as AI is a little bit, you know, scary to creepy, some people, and yeah. creepy to some people <laughs> even, um, you know, the time-saving capabilities that having a duplicate of yourself or something that represents you yeah. And being able to still build that relationship with the client or to make it look like, you know, it's still you, yeah. um, I think could be a really interesting concept that um, I'm sure we will be exploring and there'll be other groups that are doing a similar thing. Definitely. And look, it's even the halfway of that option, and this is sort of where I've ended up using it a fair bit, even just from a marketing sense, is even having a tool that because you've trained it well, writes the script for the video walkthrough of that advice. So it writes you the script, knowing your tone, knowing the way you like to say things, what analogies you like to use. And then it's like, here's your script, Peter, and there's the document and you talk through it on the video. Like that would save an inordinate amount of time, right? Because you know it's thorough. You've given it what you want it to cover. Um, it's always ticking off on the right things. And you don't have creatively have to come up with that from a blank page, and yes. that hurdle over the blank blank page is huge. I've got to say, it saved me a, f a huge amount of time in terms of that 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 first step of creativity of any type, um, you know, particularly of words. So yeah, even just getting that, you know, and and all right, this is you know, it's Monday a.m. You've got four videos to do. Here's the script for the four. Off you go. <laughs> then, wow, I can knock those out, you know. So I think I'm just sitting here wondering whether that's what I should have done in my, in my for my responses to your questions today. <laughs> Oh, wouldn't that be exciting? I love, it. Have an, exactly. have <laughs> I love it if somebody responded. Right, like, the, my, right, my responses for me. Exactly. Like, that, what a great idea. Well, now, see, you've done it for the next guest. They can then get the benefit of the insight <laughs> rather than yourself. Oh, well, next time, next time, I promise. Now, in terms of what Padua is getting involved in, you know, what else are you guys um, involved in that might be value to advisors? What other trouble are you sort of getting up to out in the financial services or the financial advice sort of um, industry? Well, the thing that is at top of mind, because there's a number of things that we are doing throughout this year, mm. but the thing that's at the top of my mind at the moment is the Financial Newswire Women in Wealth Awards yep. for 2024. There's a big ceremony that's going to be held on the 30th of May. Um, I've been asked to be part of the advisory committee, so I'm going to be involved in that, which I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to be submitting lots of nominations for the Power Planner of the Year Award oh, because very exciting. we are very, very excited about supporting women in this industry. Um, there's a lot of different categories that people can enter. Nominations close the 1st of February, so if you are thinking of submitting a nomination for someone well, a wonderful female in the financial planning or in the wealth industry, mm. then uh, please jump on board. And it's like you say, it is broader, isn't it? So there's BDMs, there's marketing, there's all sorts of categories, isn't there, for those awards? It's not just for financial advisors or even financial yep. advice businesses. It is much broader than that. 
It is. So, yeah, Investment Professional of the Year, Life Risk Insurance Professional, Marketing Communications, Platform Professional of the Year. I'm just reading through the list. Mm. Um, Mentor of the Year, Graduate of the Year. So there's there's a number of different Plenty. categories. Um, we've actually sent a reminder email out to our advisor network to ask them to put nominations in for, you know, Padua staff that have excelled. Yep. Um, and we've had a number of nominations already, which is lovely to see yeah. some you know, some feedback from our advisors on some of our power planners or quality assurance managers. Oh, that's fabulous. And it is, it's actually really great. Anytime you submit for those, no matter where it ends up, it's a great process to go through because it remembers the work somebody's done, the effort they've put in. Like it's actually a really nice recognition of somebody's contribution, even if it doesn't end up in an award, you know? So it's just summarizing it like that is fabulous. Yeah. And it's really nice to see that feedback, you know, um, we and advisors send feedback pretty regularly through, but um, I guess they've taken the time and thought about who they'd like to nominate and really put a description around why they wanted to nominate that person. And so it's lovely just even reading those. And so whether or not they get chosen um, doesn't matter. Just to see those nominations come in is really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we've covered a, a fair bit today. Is there anything else we've missed? Anything else you you want to update everybody on? Goodness. I feel like we've covered a fair We've covered bit. all our areas, I think. <laughs> Power planning and transitions and book analysis yeah. and recommend and loads. You guys have been our website. Right. New website. You've been up to loads. All right, advice explorers. If you'd like <laughs> to find out more about Padua, then you can find their website in the episode show notes. Along with Anne Marie's LinkedIn details, I'm sure be happy she'd be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, if okay. you're curious about anything that we've been chatting about. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. And at fair late notice, I should I should share with the audience you've stepped up and filled the gap for us. So thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. And you know what? I can't wait to hear what you guys have been up to in the next 12 months. Clearly you're going to get up to even more and it'll be super exciting again. So thank Thank you so much, Amory. Absolute pleasure, Peter. Happy to join you at any time, <laughs> of course. So, are you a current user of Padua? Um, maybe you've participated in one of these projects, um, the analysis and the sort of transition from, you know, maybe one platform to another or, or you know, transitioning a book into the practice. Um, please share it on insights onto the Ensemble community platform so that we can all share in, in your experience and, you know, what worked and, and what value it added, um, any tips you'd give if somebody's considering either the tech for Padua or one of these services. It's really valuable if we can all, you know, crowdsource um, our approach to these things. And as for my thoughts, I think it did, you know, that discussion um, with Anne-Marie did prompt uh, this reminder of something that I've overheard my husband, who's a carpenter, and others similar to him with that sort of training say, which is to measure twice and cut once, meaning, you know, do the analysis, make sure you've done it correctly, make sure it all makes sense, and then take the step, you know, make the cut, whether it's timber or in the business, whatever we're going to embark on and, and start implementing. And the work that um, Anne-Marie and the team can do for a practice to do all of that analysis en masse so that when you embark on a transition project, you already ideally know the outcomes for each client so that you can manage that project really thoroughly rather than discovering it as you go. Um, you know, the quality of the outcomes for each individual client, the quality of the workload for your team, the ability to plan for it. You know, you might therefore be able to group clients that you approach in certain ways so that you really get some great momentum and rigor at the way you approach these things. So, you know, using that approach where we sort of batch steps in these projects and do that analysis all in one hit makes a whole lot of sense to me um, and probably could apply to a whole lot of things we might do, you know, in other areas of the business, you know, maybe, you know, a team all of that analysis up front and then rolling out a project um, can make a whole lot of sense in the quality of the outcome and may mean how you don't embark on that project because you realize the things you'd assumed or or the averages that you were using actually didn't apply to your practice. Um, but, you know, well worth thinking through it through that way. And don't we love that we now have tech that can do the hard yards for us <laughs> for all those computations. Now, as you know, there is only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. So to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is Forecast. Now that's F-O-R-E-K. A-S-T. You can find it at forecast.com. And it has this sort of 
unprecedented look at all of the coolest events happening around the world. So it's got this comprehensive coverage of all of the event calendars on the internet. So what we're talking about is, uh, you know, a feed of events that covers categories like sport, science, space, movies, money, education, crypto, literature, technology, and loads more of categories. Um, and you can even tailor those to your interests. Uh, now, this actually came at exactly the right, t- right time for me as in 2024 is the sort of the year of me really ramping up my social media and general sort of marketing activity. And so to have timely prompts for fun things to post about or even just, you know, topical things in the moment um, between all the other more serious finance style posts has actually taken a lot of the sweat and tears out of the process for me. And as an example, if you were to head over to um, my LinkedIn page, then you'll see a LinkedIn uh, post earlier this week um, where I did a shout out to the wonderful Emily Jenkins from Ensemble as there was a community manager appreciation day. Now, the only reason I was aware of that as a day was because the forecast app told me. So, and as an example of other things, so I'm just looking at it now, what's it telling me about in say the upcoming week? Well, of course it's, it's mentioning, you know, Australia Day coming up. That makes sense. Um, you know, Monday, which is the day I'm recording now before Friday that it'll be released and you'll be happily listening. You know, Monday's National Hot Sauce Day. Maybe there's a great post you could do along that. Um, there's, you know, National Peanut Butter Day. Um, there's all sorts of other, you know, release of things. Uh, there's, you know, release of mini series that are being done. They've even got that down to those sort of premieres. Um, They've got, you know, the Royal Caribbean icon of the seas maiden voyage happens on the 27th. So this is like all sorts of things that are going on. The NFL playoffs, conference championships, national Lego day, right? The Finnish presidential election. I mean, like it's, (laughs) you won't believe how much the volume of things that are calendar based items that will just give you something that if you're thinking, I just need to post something fun, There'll be a a puzzle day will come up and you can, you know, design a post that you can pop up to engage your audience in either socials or newsletter or even blog posts. So check it out. And I'd love to know if it really does help you with a bit of your creativity and and helps you moving through the year as we sort of all run out of a bit of juice when it comes to coming up with with ideas for socials. So um, I'll be using it myself. So share if that gave you any value. And um, I'll look forward to seeing some more of those sort of things coming out on everybody's feed as we go through the year. Well, that's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each week. Now, we are rapidly coming up to March and International Women's Day for 2024. And so right now, I still have a couple of time slots available. So if you would like an engaging session for your International Women's Day event, then my keynote, Her Financial Drum Roll from Money Literacy to Unparalleled Economic Leadership the session sort of draws a parallel between the music industry's glittering success stories, people like Taylor Swift, and the broader economic and industry landscape. Now, I'm not a Swifty myself, but she's a very interesting character from both a musical and business perspective. And so I use um, her narrative as a lens to explore the disparity between women's roles in driving progress and their low representation in decision-making positions in business. So, you know, we delve into how personal financial literacy and empowerment are really crucial first steps towards broader economic empowerment for women in a very broad range of industries. If you'd love to know more, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's at forward slash Peter MD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I will very much look forward to turning up in your eBuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious.